darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. Although Rebecca Lennox enjoys a fairy tale life, she harbors a dark secret that could rip it apart. She keeps it hidden until a barrage of terrifying visions launches her on a collision course with her past and an intense battle with her ultimate fear. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Some believe there are restless, earthbound spirits who drift aimlessly, unaware that they are dead, all the while seeking comfort from the living. But when lost souls are ignored, they sometimes get angry and must break through the physical realm to make their presence known. Some of the participants of this program appear in shadow to protect their privacy. She was an angel. <laughs> Good night, Becky. I'll see you next week. In the fall of 1974, seven-year-old Rebecca Mallory lives in the New Jersey suburbs. Like all parents, her father, New Jersey Police Officer Sergeant Bill Mallory, worries about keeping her safe and happy. Can't forget this little guy. <laughs> Hi, Papa. How was your day? We played checkers and I won. Oh, good for you. As an only child, Rebecca is close with her family, including her Pop Pop. My great grandfather, who I knew as Pop Pop, was very friendly and I, I really liked having him around. <sighs> Buckle up, honey. motorcycle was laid out on the ground and the driver was a good few feet away from the bike stay in the car dispatch I got a 901 at the intersection of Maine and Mendham Road request assistance immediately how did you know Becky pop pop told me Honey, Pop-Pop has been dead for five years. He died when I was six months old. My Pop-Pop being in the back seat was actually normal. The accident happening in front of me was, was what upset me. Okay. Okay. It was a scary experience for a five-year-old to see a motorcycle accident happen just, you know, 10 feet away. It was bizarre. Keep your voice down. Huh? The strange incident I mean, troubles Rebecca's father. The kid sees things. My mother insisted to my father, her exact words were pretty much, I'm telling you the kid sees it, I'm telling you the kid sees things. Maybe she has a gift. Papa did, I mean, he knew when he was gonna and die. And the week before he died, Pop-Pop made arrangements for it. 
announcing that he wouldn't be around after the weekend. I don't buy it. He died on a Saturday afternoon, just like he said he would. Don't start that. You know I don't believe in that stuff. It made me feel like a little liar. Rebecca is torn. She loves her father, but Pop Pop is her best friend. I think that's a splendid idea. Pop Pop would come to me often during the day, and he would sit and we would play, and I never wanted him to leave. Did she go in the um, bedroom? This is a rocking chair. It can go in the living room, the bedroom, or the attic. Rebecca's dad begins to worry about his daughter's well-being. Over the next year, Rebecca grows into a well-adjusted young girl but continues to see spirits that others cannot see. Hello. I'm Carl. What's your name? Becky. I'm seven, but I'll be eight soon. Rebecca, stop it. There's nobody there. The steps are empty. But, Daddy, there was a man sitting on the steps. It's hard to explain to somebody else that you can see a reality that they can't. There was a man with a blue jacket and his name was Rebecca's Carl. father cannot come to terms with his daughter's odd behavior. She is too old for imaginary friends. Pop Pop and all these friends are in your head. But, Daddy, I see them. Then just block it out. Just block it out. It was upsetting for a child to have your father yell at you for something that you can't help. Light turns There's no switch that I can turn off and on. And that was probably the day that I started realizing that I had to hide it. I promise, Daddy, I promise I'll stop. my teenage years and early 20s, I just kept it completely to myself. If so I saw something that nobody else saw, I would just look away and carry on as if I didn't see it. Rebecca gets married in 1995 and years later suffers through a bitter divorce. Southeastern Virginia with her two children, seven-year-old Tim and five-year-old Hannah. All right. Now, you guys settle down, OK? Or you're going back to your own beds. It was easy for me to ignore everything while I was a single mom following my divorce because I was working 50 hours a week and raising two babies. <laughs> at this point in her life, she's become an expert at blocking out any unwanted visitors. demanding work schedule and raising two children, Rebecca makes time for fundraising at a local children's hospital. Thank you for coming. Your name? Daniel Lennox. In early 2003, Rebecca meets Daniel Lennox, a successful dentist in the area. I can never get these things hooked. Here, let me. The two feel an immediate attraction. Thank you. Um, uh, Rebecca. Thank you. 
I was engaged to be married when I met Rebecca, and uh, we really hit it off, and, and then I ended up breaking off the engagement, and we started dating. <laughs> what? I love you, Becky. I love Hannah and Tim. Will you be my family? <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh. oh, Dan. It's beautiful. Oh, I love you so much. They marry right away, eager to start their lives together. After Daniel and I got married, um, we moved to a new house. We started talking about maybe having a baby. Everything was great, life was good. Daniel is a devoted husband and a loving father to Tim and Hannah. We pretty much became your typical ideal family. Weeks later. <laughs> when I first saw him, the hair in the back of my neck stood up. You get that chill, and it's almost like you're too afraid to move. I didn't want to acknowledge that it was there. Block it out. Just block it out. Block it out. <laughs> I couldn't choose not to see him. He was there regardless. Rebecca is terrified. For some reason, she cannot block out this spirit. Rebecca worries that the recent sighting will open up a chapter in her life that she closed long ago. His presence was almost like a threat to the peaceful, happy little life that I had established. Hey, Mom, can I watch TV? You know what, um, dinner is almost ready, so go wash your hands, okay? Hi, honey. <laughs> hey, go wash your hands, okay? Dinner's almost ready. I must have seen about two dozen patients today. How was your day? As always, she keeps her secret honey. to herself. Honey? I'm sorry, what? Is everything all right, Rebecca? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm really tired, that's all, that's all. That's it, no big deal. I didn't tell Daniel. I was afraid that would open a whole can of worms I didn't want him to know about. As the days go by, 
Rebecca hides her fears and tries to keep things as routine as possible for her family. The day I saw the little boy's spirit in the hallway, I decided to accept it, but not share it with anybody else. Daniel senses that something is bothering Rebecca. I knew that if I pushed too hard, that she might just close up and not tell me anything. So I figured, you know, She'll tell me in her own time. I was afraid that my husband would either not believe me and think that I was just crazy, or he would believe me, but would react in the same manner that my dad had 20 years ago. daily. I got fed up and I yelled at him to stop and then I felt terribly guilty for yelling at a child. Later that night. You going to bed? Yeah, I have an early morning tomorrow. Don't stay up too late, okay? I'm right behind you, I promise. Love you. Love you too. Hugging at my blanket. Tim? I sat up thinking it had to be my son, but there was nobody in the room. Just like a little kid would giggle. She discovers a tiny bite mark. The bite mark looked like a small mouth, and you could even see where the top four teeth were all misaligned and crooked.
first time in her life, Rebecca is faced with an unimaginable revelation. No! Being actually physically bitten took it to a whole new level. My entire life, no matter what I saw or what I heard, no being had ever actually touched me. To know that they can touch you was terrifying. Couldn't sleep without me, huh? I was afraid of what my husband would think if I told him. Rebecca? What does this look like to you? And he was in total shock. Well, it didn't break the skin. From the looks of the bite, there was nothing that could have done it to her except for a very small human mouth. Did one of the kids bite you? No, they're both asleep. I think it was something else. Honey, this is a child's bite. I can see where one of the front teeth are crooked. Rebecca, what's going on? And I told him, I think, a ghost bit me. I keep seeing the spirit of a little boy out by the tree line. Rebecca still can't bring herself to reveal everything to Daniel. I was too afraid and too confused and too scared to go into anything further than that at that time. Daniel, but I swear it's true. I see him as clearly as I see you. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know how to react. I had never been faced with anything like this before. Why didn't you tell me? Because I was afraid you'd think I was crazy. The presence of the bite mark is contrary to everything Daniel believes. I didn't want to believe it was something paranormal, but faced with the evidence, I, I didn't know what else I was supposed to believe. No, no, what, Daniel, what are you doing? Daniel insists on getting professional help but Rebecca is resistant because she doesn't want him to know any more than what she has already told him. I didn't want this to happen again. That was the main thing. I wanted answers, and to that end, to protect my family, the only thing that I knew to do was to contact somebody that knew more about these things than I do. Daniel searches the internet for hours, studying hauntings and looking for paranormal investigators in southeastern Virginia. He finds a group with solid credentials, the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation, a nonprofit organization based near Richmond. Daniel contacts the group and sends them the digital pictures. out of the house. He is willing to try anything. I don't know who you are or what you want, but I want you out. Leave my family alone. Investigator from the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation comes to the house. Here are the uh, photos I took of the bite mark. Can I see the actual bite mark? It's not there anymore. I see. Mrs. Lennox, is this the first time you've experienced paranormal phenomenon? Um, yes, but it was no big deal. Rebecca, he bit you. Daniel is surprised when Rebecca downplays the incident. 
He wasn't trying to hurt me. I didn't want anybody else in it. The sooner I could forget about it, the better. Entities like this are usually harmless. They'll go away. The investigator tells anyone. them that the spirit will likely go away on its own. Yeah, I'm sure that it will, but we appreciate you coming out. I took her word that we were probably going to be OK. I started to feel a little bit more at ease. Uh, we will. Okay. Thanks again. Uh -huh. Rebecca is relieved when the investigator leaves. As far as I was concerned, that was the ideal outcome. Just go away. My husband kind of let it go. It seemed to be like a small storm that I had ridden out. And I thought it was over. The house is quiet for two weeks. Nothing else happened. We were fine. We started to get back into our routine again, and it was almost kind of forgotten. Once again, Rebecca hopes to put the past behind her. started hearing the male voice, and it was almost as if he were in the kitchen. And this male voice seemed to grow closer to me, almost right behind my head. She's visibly very shaken. And she kept asking me, don't you hear him? Don't you hear him? Can't you hear that? And I said, no, I don't hear anything. And I didn't. I could tell by the look on her face that she wished that I hadn't witnessed it. Maybe she thought I was going to leave her, and that never really crossed my mind. Are you sure he said P-51 and Mustang? Yeah, why? I said a P-51 is a, a military aircraft. It's a, an aircraft from World War II, and they, they also flew in Korea. I said, what's this all about? Daniel is confused. Rebecca knows nothing about World War II planes. Mommy! Mom, what's wrong? Nothing, honey. Mommy and Daddy were just talking about something a little too loud. Okay, but hey, who wants some ice cream? Relax, I'll get the ice cream. Yay! I want sprinkles! Okay. Not sure what to do. Daniel searches for any information he can find on P 51 aircraft and possible crashes in the area. When Daniel was trying to come up with some kind of logical explanation as to what had happened, I was thinking, oh my God, he is going to completely demand that I go see a psychiatrist and they're going to medicate me, and that's the end of that. This is over. Does this picture mean anything to you? No, nothing at all. Rebecca's relieved that Daniel believes her, but she refuses to dwell on the incident. She just wanted to kind of close the lid on it and not talk about it and not deal with it. I was upset and angry because I couldn't fix this problem and I couldn't help her. 
In the days that follow, Rebecca starts to withdraw from Daniel. Hey, Hannah, open it up wide so you can get the leaves in. Good. I was afraid that I had just begun a downward spiral. I could tell that she had obviously seen something. Rebecca. Did you see something? No. Are you sure? D D Daniel, I didn't see anything. I'm fine. I think we should call the investigators again. No. 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 Look, we did it. One day while the kids are in school, Daniel takes Rebecca on a day trip to nearby Williamsburg, hoping to take her mind off of things at home. So have you guys decided, or do you need a few more minutes? Honey. Oh, I'll, um, I'll just have what you're having. Rebecca is despondent and begins to wonder about her own sanity. There are times, many times, where I have to sit back and ask myself if I belong in a padded cell on Thorazine or if it's all really real. Once you start doubting your own sanity, everybody around you will. Both have the special place. Rebecca, I don't know what to say, except that I'm here for you. I'm fine, Daniel. OK? I'm. I'm, I'm... I'm fine. People can only take so much. And if these unexplained things were happening to her constantly, it was going to take a toll on her. Later, on the way home. <laughs> Rebecca hears the voice of an old woman. Daniel hears nothing. Where is my china for my receipt? Where are my receipts? You can't do this to me. Are you hearing something? Here in the car? Just write it down, okay? Elizabeth Pratt Jones. Oh, write this down too. Um, she said her property was taken from her and it was unfair and she was not to tolerate it. That the magistrate didn't listen, sold her slaves at auction and she didn't see a penny of it. I was completely and utterly stunned. And I thought to myself, she hasn't told me everything. And it was at that point that I realized that she was really the, the focal point of all this. gives his wife some space. My name is Elizabeth Pratt Jones. Rebecca is stunned. The woman she heard in the car is now in her home. Listen to me. Either we move out of this house or we call the investigators. It's your choice. Call the investigators tomorrow. It was a huge turning point for me. 
I was tired of keeping it to myself. So why not just go the distance and finally get it out there? In the morning, Daniel calls back the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation. Your group analyzed our house. He speaks with the new regional director, Tom Varanis. Varanis is a scientist. He worked at NASA as an aeronautical researcher for 35 years. My work with NASA gave me a good solid background in studying scientific research. What we are looking for is the possibility of proving paranormal activity does exist through instrumentation and through scientific research. Varanis agrees to meet with the couple and run a few tests on the property. Is uh, Thursday convenient? The sooner the better. I'll be there around 7. Thanks. calls upon Melissa Kepley to help with the investigation. My degree is in psychology. I am brought in to observe during the interview process to see if I see any red flags that may indicate some type of mental instability. Tell me about the little boy, Rebecca. I don't like thinking about him. He makes me feel sad. Well, he was a child, he wanted attention, and I yelled at him to go away. I believe Rebecca and Daniel wanted some type of physical verification that what she was experiencing was in the environment, that it was not in her head. Did he frighten you? No, no, the only thing that really scared me was that I could see him, but nobody else could. The one that I was really shocked was the that Rebecca was revealing as much as she was to the investigators. And I wasn't so much shocked at the things that she had seen and heard. I was more shocked that she was willing to tell all of these things that we had just kept between ourselves for so long. With your permission, we'd like to set up some equipment to take some EMF readings inside and out. Yeah, go ahead. Tom and Melissa use electromagnetic frequency meters to monitor fluctuations that can signal the presence of a spirit or entity. They must investigate every source of the EMF readings before they can determine whether the fluctuations are caused by something supernatural. We decided that it was a good idea to check around the outside of the premises just in case there may be something causing EMF readings because we were spotting some EMF readings that were changing periodically over time. They quickly realize that the fluctuations are due to an air conditioning unit. Power cable's buried. It supplies the whole house. Most of the EMF readings recorded around the property prove inconclusive. So Tom and Melissa try using a compass. EMF readings uh, can be done with a compass. A compass will pick up a magnetic field and will cause it to move. When we put the compass and an EMF meter near Rebecca, we saw the compass spin. An EMF meter lit up. That is something we associate with an entity and not with a human being, especially with these particular meters. And that was a big surprise to us. We didn't get any indication that the house was haunted, per se. However, we did get some high EMF readings in the hallway, especially near Rebecca. Rebecca, have you told us everything? 
The house isn't haunted. I am. I've seen entities, spirits, whatever you want to call them, ever since I was a little girl. I did tell them everything from my great-grandfather as a young child in my room to the accident, uh, straight on up to the pilot. Ever since we moved in here, I haven't been able to ignore these things like I used to. And when I couldn't ignore the little boy, and then I couldn't ignore the pilot, and then Elizabeth, I just, I panicked. I was finally able to say, there it all is. There's everything. And now I don't have to hide anymore. It was a huge relief. Do you think I'm crazy? We were convinced that we weren't dealing with someone who was mentally unstable and that we weren't dealing with a hoaxer. We were dealing with someone who legitimately had experienced something. Why haven't you told me any of this before? I'm sorry, Danny. <laughs> I was just so afraid you'd think I was crazy. <laughs> because of the lack of physical evidence, the investigators follow up with additional research at the College of William and Mary. We had to take the information that they had shared with us and then investigate that on a historical side. Did these people actually exist that she claims she has talked to? If we could prove that they existed, now we had something that was quite interesting to everyone. feeling I've ever experienced in my life. It was fear and sadness all at the same time. I felt it before I saw it. This palpable danger. As it passed out the door, the feeling of dread went away. Daniel fears that the shadow is an ominous manifestation of the pilot, and his presence is an omen that something terrible is about to happen. The Lennox family soon moves to a new home on the other side of town. For the next couple of weeks, things are peaceful, Rebecca and Daniel put the past behind them. He didn't like to cook. Hello? Oh, hi, Tom. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Tonight, tonight will be fine. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. They found something. What? The thing I wanted the most from the paranormal Sorry. investigators was validation. I didn't necessarily want to get rid of the entities because I don't believe that they can be gotten rid of. In the same way that she didn't ask them to come around, I don't think she can ask them to leave either. I think we that night, Rebecca and Daniel meet with the CPRI team. This article is from the Daily Press. It's dated March 16th, 1950. Two pilots ferrying P-51 Mustangs crashed 600 yards from the couple's former home. 
that's amazing. Before revealing the rest of their findings, Baranis has some questions for Rebecca. We wanted to make sure that we weren't being fooled. I think Rebecca was being very honest, but we have to make sure that the information she's giving us, there's some accuracy there. So we comprised a little test for her. Rebecca, look at these names, these photographs. He gives her a list of names without telling her which one is the pilot. This is him, Harold Schultz. Only his friends called him Hank. And the other pilot was William Wellerman. Rebecca easily picks out the names of the two pilots mentioned in the newspaper article. It was a moment of, of just shocking revelation that, my gosh, she just had a list of 20 names. She picked two out, and she even gave more information than what they had given her. Then Tom asks her to identify the pilot, Harold Schultz, from a lineup of photos. Harold Schultz's photo isn't here. You're right. It was pretty exciting to actually see it firsthand and witness this. Was this a laboratory environment, you know, with sensors tied to somebody's brain? No, it was not. But it, we felt it was a good enough test for what we were trying to do at the time. Without a name, the little boy is untraceable. <laughs> what about Elizabeth? According to records at William and Mary, Elizabeth Pratt Jones lived on Henry Street during the 1700s. Her husband was a failed businessman, and the state confiscated the family's property to cover their debts. It seems that Rebecca's supernatural gift attracted Elizabeth in Williamsburg, over 30 miles from Rebecca's home. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. It's a huge relief, but it's still really hard to overcome that fear of coming out of the closet, so to speak, with this. Since the move, Rebecca has not seen or heard the little boy or the pilot. She believes that their spirits are somehow connected to the old house, and they were drawn to her because of her sixth sense. Over time, Rebecca learns to accept her gift. Right now, I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on it. But I also know enough to know that I can't predict what tomorrow might bring as far as this sighting and, and hearing the entities goes. I could see one tomorrow. I could see one as I'm walking out to my car to take the kids to school. You never know. Spencer are elated when they find the perfect apartment in a quaint Seattle neighborhood. And new beginnings. But their hopes for the future are soon shattered when they are confronted by the supernatural. Intruders with a dark history hold them captive, making them the victims of their violent rage. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. The famous Space Needle towers above Seattle, Washington, a symbol of the hopes and dreams of those mariners and mill workers who founded this city more than 150 years ago. It was a place where people came to make a fresh start, escape from the past. But for some, the past is not easily buried. It clings like a lonely shadow and reappears 
when least expected. October 2004. I'm never gonna pass this midterm. What's with the negativity? You've got to have a positive attitude, my friend. I have a positive attitude. I'm positive I'm going to fail. <laughs> Marissa Spencer, known to her friends as Icy, is a graduate student working toward a master's degree in mental health. So, how is married life? You know, we've been so busy. Icy has been married for a couple of months now and eagerly welcomes this new phase in her life. Everything's exciting. Everything seemed to be in that stage that you're trying to get to know all these things about this person. We were having a lot of fun. It was an adventure. Speak of the devil. Hey, honey. Her husband, Bill, is also a student, studying for his bachelor's degree. At night, Bill works as a contractor for a local courier company. Tear you away, but I found this apartment and it looks great. So I set up an appointment first to see it today. Wow, this does look promising. Yeah. Is it okay if I steal her away from it? Please, maybe when I see you next, you have a new apartment. Let's hope. I'll see you later. Bill is anxious to leave the university district, having grown tired of the rowdy college lifestyle. It's more of a party atmosphere. It's not really the best atmosphere for a, a young married couple. This almost looks too good to be true. Don't jinx it now. I know. I'm just so ready to start our new lives in some new place. Away from all of this. I got a good feeling about this one. I know. I'm so sick of our apartment now. We wanted to go to a, an area that was more quiet, more of a traditional family setting. Icy is delighted to learn that the apartment is located in the historic Ballard neighborhood just outside of Seattle. What attracted me to that area is, it's like a park-like setting. And there are these old buildings that have a lot of uh, coffee shops and little consignment stores. It's a family-oriented place. I felt pretty safe walking down the street at night there. When the Spencers arrive at the apartment complex, they notice a pile of debris right in front of the building. Yeah, hi, I'm Bill. This is my wife. Ah, uh, it's Marissa, right? Yes, but everybody calls me Icy. Well, Bill, Icy, I really apologize for the mess out front. It's not normally like this. We're finishing up renovations on the apartment today. What, the apartment for rent? Uh, yeah, the previous tenant The left building the manager room. told us that the former tenant left it in a bit of a in a hurry, no, and it wasn't story. looking very nice, so they decided to rip everything apart and uh, just basically rebuild it inside. Uh, it says in the ad, all new fixtures. Oh yeah, whoever gets this gets a brand new one bedroom apartment. Shall we go have a look? Yeah, Sounds come on. Good. The renovations will be complete today, and after that the place will be ready for new tenants. To get a nice, you know, newly remodeled apartment in a great area of town for not a lot of money it was truly a, a stroke of luck, it seemed at the time. The place has everything the young couple is looking for, yet Bill can't help but feel apprehensive. There was something about the apartment that didn't seem right to me. So how does it look in here? Everything seems to be okay. That's it? Don't you think this place is perfect? It's pretty good. Pretty good? It's gonna be like we're living in a brand new place. It's in our price range too. What's wrong? You don't like it? No, no, it, it's not that. You know what, you're right. I just can't believe we found a place this nice this soon, that's all. But you're right, it's perfect. So you like it? I didn't say anything because I, well, it kind of seemed silly to turn down a perfect apartment for, you know, a feeling. Well, then what are we waiting for?
The following week, the Spencers move in. Icy works on transforming the apartment into a home. I felt like I wasn't alone. It just felt so eerie. Icy convinces herself that her mind is just playing tricks on her. I thought, we're just moving in, we have all this stress, I'm just tense, I haven't slept in days, so maybe I'm just not used to this place. Days pass, and Icy, preoccupied with her new role as a wife, puts the incident out of her mind. I was just so happy to be with him, to be there. I was hoping that we could have a family of our own, do normal family things, and uh, basically just to have a normal life. All set. You know, we gotta get a move on if we're gonna get there on time. Okay, but wait a sec. How do I look? You look great. But you should probably dress warm because it's getting cold outside. Well, it's just a little difficult to get dressed when you won't tell me where we're going. I told you, all right? We got the best table in town, but we're gonna lose it if we don't get a move on. Bill, are you sure we can... I mean, this is really sweet and all, but right now we can't afford to spend money on some fancy restaurant. Don't worry about it, okay? Everything's been taken care of. Besides, I think with the way we've been working, we deserve a celebration. Come on. Our financial situation at that time wasn't really the best. All of a sudden, all these expenses would show up, and we were really struggling for a while. That weekend, Bill tells Icy that they deserve a much-needed break announces that he's taking her out for the night. Well, you are full of surprises, aren't you? I told you we could afford it. Get the blanket. I felt very fulfilled at that time. It just signified a new beginning. We were very excited about it. The next morning, Bill rises early and lets Icy sleep in. For the first time in weeks, the couple has no classes, work, or unpacking to worry about. corner of my eye, some figure was moving. Whoa, jumping this morning? No, I didn't hear you come in, you startled me, that's all. So what's going on outside? It's nothing. So, what do you want for breakfast, huh? Mmm, coffee sounds good. Mm, you're too good to me. I really wasn't that concerned with it. There didn't seem to be anything to it other than just creepiness. A 
month after they move in, the Spencers finally feel settled in the apartment. Icy can now concentrate on her schoolwork. I just have to fire off this email to my professor. Bill? What are you doing? There was somebody in front of the door, in front of me. I was sure that I saw something. But an investigation of the apartment reveals nothing is amiss. I didn't really believe in ghosts. I thought people made up all these stories. I just didn't think it could be true. It's not rational. But I know in the back of my mind that there was something there. I just didn't want to admit it. How's your day? What's the matter? I need to tell you something. But I'm afraid you're gonna think I'm crazy. <laughs> Anything's possible. This isn't funny, Bill. All right, all right, try me. Something's going on in this apartment. I don't know exactly what it is, but I've got the strangest feeling that... Well, then what? That we're not alone. What are you talking about? I've been seeing things through the corner of my eye, like shadows or something going past the doorways. She was certainly afraid and certainly concerned about what she had seen and a little as, panicky. As soon as I look up, they're gone. I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm sure everything's fine. I don't know. Well, I thought initially that it was an overreaction. thought it might have been just a run of the mill typical standard story where things go bump in the night. Have you considered the fact that you, you're at a computer all day? I mean... Well, I kind of today, downplayed today. everything, thinking that it's not that big a deal. Oh, it's just my imagination? No, no, what I'm saying is your eyes are tired and they're probably playing tricks on you. I'm sorry. It's silly, I know. No, it's not silly. It's just, you know, I'm here, so don't worry about it, okay? He was so reassuring. He wanted everything to be okay. So I felt like I was over-dramatizing. October turns to November, and Icy is still on edge. She doesn't like to be in the apartment alone, but Icy no longer feels that she can talk with her husband about it. I didn't feel like he was really listening to me. He was just, oh, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. She avoids going home after class, killing time at a local coffee shop until Bill gets off work. I tried to stay out as much as I could because I just could not bear the feelings I was having in that apartment.
Eventually, Icy has no other choice but to return to the apartment. When I opened the door and I stepped foot in the apartment, it felt so tense. I felt like I was the one who was intruding. I just felt like somebody was really watching what I was doing and it was really scary. today. The funniest thing happened when we started laughing so hard that we all started to remember when you... Could you just give me a little room here? What's the matter with you? I've got to finish making dinner. And I've got this huge exam that I still haven't studied for, but I think it's just great that you're having so much fun at work. Her attitudes seem to change. She went from yes, being, you know, fun and outgoing and cheerful to being more withdrawn, kind of moody. You know, it was, it was quite disturbing. That's a little obnoxious, and I think you're overreacting a bit. That's your answer for everything. I'm overreacting now, just like I'm overreacting about whatever the hell is in our house. For crying out loud, is that what this is about? Yes, that's what this is all about. I thought we are past all this. That's easy for you to say. You're never home. Well, I don't know what you want me to do. I want to know that you're taking this seriously. Why can't you just let this drop? You know what? I'm not hungry anymore. You want dinner? Make it yourself. It seemed like my wife was blaming me for not having answers or, or solutions for what was going on. It was very frustrating to not be able to come up with something. That night, Bill and Icy go to bed angry at each other and do not speak until the following evening. Spencer, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I've just been just off lately. Not myself. You were right. No, no, look, you were right. I've, I've been kind of a jerk lately. No. No, I have, all right? You don't have to sugarcoat it for me. I can take it. Ugly domestic squabble, yeah, I think so. And hey, we survived. I suppose we did. Hey, why don't you uh, take a break from your studying tonight, okay? And we can get some leftovers for dinner and pop in a movie and uh, just relax. What do you say? Well, okay.
is it? What happened? I saw somebody go down the hall into the bathroom, but whoever or what, whatever it was just, it disappeared. I saw a tall, thin, dark figure. It was unnerving because I, I went into the bathroom and it wasn't there. What did he look like? I don't know, it was like a, a shadow of a person. Oh my God, that's the same thing that I've seen. What are we gonna do? What can we do, right? It was, uh, it was nothing. Oh, God, Phil, you know there's something in this apartment with us. I wasn't that sure that I really believed in ghosts at that time. It just didn't seem, it doesn't seem rational. I can't keep pretending that there's nothing wrong. You're making me feel like I'm crazy, and I know I'm not. Where are you going? I don't know. Gotta get out of here. Well, wait, I'm gonna come with you. That night, the Spencers find refuge at a local coffee shop. There, Bill finally realizes that Icy's fears are valid and agrees that they must do something. There was certainly no denying that, you know, we had both seen figures in the apartment, and we quickly realized we both wanted out of that apartment. Do you think we could somehow get out of our lease? What are we going to say? We don't like... risk of sounding crazy is, is a powerful suppressant. So that was certainly a big reason why we didn't ask anyone to help us get out. No matter how much Bill and Icy want to leave their apartment, they know they are tied to it. We had nowhere to go and we needed help. So we went online and searched and we found the Washington State Ghost Society. They were in Seattle. The next day at the Washington Ghost Society, Shannon Stidman comes across the email from the Spencers. Stidman has been a paranormal investigator for over six years and has witnessed supernatural events. Even still, she broaches each message with caution. A lot of things can be mistaken for paranormal phenomena. So we like to take our time and make sure that they're credible and that we're really dealing with a ghost. In her response, Stidman outlines the basic steps that she gives to all potential clients. Our advice initially was for them to keep logs of the activity, to keep in touch with us so we could monitor the situation, to see if things would get worse, get better, stabilize. If there is indeed a presence in their home and the activity escalates, Stidman knows that it's only a matter of time before they will hear from the Spencers again. Oddly enough, over the next month, Bill and Icy no longer sense a presence lurking in the shadows. It is a welcome relief for the couple, who feel like newlyweds once again. I got three words for you. Are they, I love you? Oh, well, there's that, but no, I was thinking of three others. No more homework. <laughs> All right, time to call it a night. You're right. Oh, there's just one other thing. Despite the lack of activity, Icy takes Shannon Stidman's advice and keeps a ghost log. Do you really think this is gonna work? I don't know, but you've got to admit, it hasn't hurt. For a time, things seemed to, you know, calm down. There seemed to be a, a period of peace, and we were both optimistic and hopeful that maybe the worst was over and you know, things would get back to normal. A week later, Bill and Icy enjoy another quiet evening at home. Promise me next time you're gonna try really hard not to cheat. Cheat? Are you calling me a cheater? <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> I think someone's just a sore loser. Can't take being beat by a girl. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> killing me.
I saw him. I saw his face. A teenage boy. Really you mean a boy? looked like he had been hurt pretty bad. It looked like his face had been severely damaged by something. What do you mean, a boy? How? I don't know. Somehow I could see him and you... You're gonna think I'm crazy, but I... I don't think that he's evil. And I was still holding on to the hope that this was not that big a deal, and maybe that there were ways that we could diminish the impact of whatever this was. Well, it doesn't make it any less creepy. I don't want this thing in her home. I know, I know, but I just get the feeling he's trying to tell us something. glimpse of the teenage boy only leaves the couple with more questions. What did happen to him? Was he maybe killed in that apartment? And what about the people who did that to him? Although the presence does not threaten the couple, Icy feels trapped. I had nowhere else to go. And it was pretty horrible to live that way. It just felt really desperate. I was living in a nightmare. Icy begins to feel helpless and desperate, believing there is no way out of this apartment. I'm a strong person, but I felt like I was losing control over everything in my life. I just felt like death was all around me. The whole apartment felt like it was a huge crypt. <laughs> By December, only two months after moving into the apartment, Icy becomes physically and emotionally exhausted. I totally felt like I was becoming somebody else. Like I was moving under a, under a spell. She is unable to keep up with the demands of school, sending her deeper into depression. I would be thinking these horrible things I felt like hurting myself. I was always sad. I felt like it was so unbearable. Hey, Icy. I'm sorry. How did you do on the final? Here we go. 
at that point, I wasn't really talking much to anybody. I was avoiding people. I didn't want them to think that I was nuts. That night. Where have you been? You know, you should have been home hours ago. You could have at least called, told me where you were. I've been worried sick. Just flunked my exam, okay? And that means I flunked the class. I see. Oh, I see. I'm what exactly? as if somebody had put out a lit cigarette on my chest. I see flee the apartment, terrified by the violent intruder. Both of us were only concerned with getting out of that place right then and there. It could strike any time. There was nothing that we could do to defend ourselves against whatever this was. They drive aimlessly for hours, trying to make sense of what just happened. We were definitely at the end of our ropes at that point. Unable to gather their wits, they check into a motel to regroup. They contact the Washington Ghost Society again. But this time, the Spencers hope to convince them that they are truly victims of the paranormal. That day, investigator Shannon Stidman meets with the frightened couple. Well, it certainly seems like a lot has gone on since that first email you sent. And it's apparent that the What struck me most about Bill and Icy's story was that I events were escalating. It was becoming dangerous to live there. So that's when we got involved. I have a few theories about what I think might be going on based upon what you've told me so far. One of the first things that you mentioned was that the apartment had been renovated. That stuck out to me from the very beginning. Is that important? Stidman believes that any entities trapped in the apartment could have been unleashed during recent renovations. Anytime you tear apart a structure, it disturbs the psychic energy. And renovations in a haunted house either make the hauntings go away entirely or they make them worse. And in this case, it seems to have contributed to the activity. A common theme in hauntings is that something traumatic happened. The image seen by Bill was a sign there was something definitely going on in there, something very powerful, something very strong. But why attack Bill? We've been there for weeks, and nothing like this has ever happened. Stidman explains that some entities feed on emotions, such as fear and anger. Negative energy gives them the ability to intensify the activity. Is that what this is about? Yes, that's what this is all about. We're past all this. You never helped. You just let this drop. If they start to become afraid of it, their energy will feed the entity. It will do something more dramatic. And it's just a matter of time before something harms them physically in some way. So what do we do now? We go back. <laughs> now. No, 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 I can't go back there. But we need you there in case the investigators have questions. 
Icy is scared, but she realizes that this may be the only way to take back some control. It's like I was at their mercy. But I just didn't want these things to defeat me. Okay, we'll go back. But I'm not setting a foot in that apartment. Hours later, the ghost hunters arrive. They hope to document any strange activity so they can better understand what is occurring in the Spencer's apartment. The investigative team includes two paranormal specialists and medium, Lois Lee. I first started suspecting that I had psychic abilities when I was in my late teens. When I got a little bit older, I was able to describe ghosts that were in houses. Is that the psychic? Yes, but I prefer that you stay right here and have no contact with her until after she's finished her investigation of the house and grounds. We want her to be totally unbiased. The psychic goes in knowing nothing. We do not want her to be influenced by what we already know. We want to be sure that any vibes she gets, any impressions she gets are from her, not from things that she's been told. Can I have the key? aids investigators by providing a shortcut to the past, sometimes even communicating with the spirits. My procedure is to go into a place and start putting my hands on the walls or objects in the room to try and be able to see into the past. The images come to me pretty naturally. If I'm focusing hard enough, they can become so real that it, it's almost like they are there. I didn't feel anything. I didn't have my usual sensations that there was a spirit there. such a pathetic figure, young, maybe about 18, 17 years old, and I felt so sorry for him. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. No, don't worry, I won't hurt you. Then, another feeling, menacing and dark, begins to overwhelm her. I started to feel myself changing. I was kind of getting the sensation of being the body of somebody watching him. feel in my hand a gun. Please don't kill me. was just horrible. The next thing I know, I was running. I've never really seen that much physical human gore in a vision before. It's kind of like your first time in a morgue. Oh my God, Lois! Lois, are you okay? I'll be fine, I just need to catch my breath. Of all the investigations we've done, we've, she's seen a lot of things, she's heard a lot of things, she's felt things, but she's never been, I'd never seen her that badly shaken before. What happened in there? I, I, don't, I don't know. I've never experienced anything like this. 
Never. What did you see? I saw a young boy. That's exactly what I saw. She had the very same impression of that youth that I did. And it was kind of a validation that we were not crazy and that we weren't just, you know, overreacting. You two got out just in the nick of time. We don't know what's going to happen next. You can't go back in there. Stidman believes it unwise for the couple to return to their home. If Bill and Icy had decided to stay in the apartment, it would have just continued to escalate. How bad it would have gotten, I don't know. Lois has a psychic impression of what may have occurred in the apartment. My conclusion on what I saw was that it might have been drug related. It seemed like there might have been some gang activity involved. It felt like a retribution crime. Over the next week, the investigative team puts together a report on the details of the haunting. They found no evidence of EVPs and have recorded no unusual visual information. They do turn to history to see if they can get any insight into the haunting. Further research reveals that the neighborhood was once the site of violent gang and drug activity. Although there are no clear-cut answers to what occurred in the apartment, the Spencers are satisfied with the outcome of the investigation. I don't know if I could go on in life asking myself time and again what was haunting that apartment and why. A lot of pieces fit in together, and that was basically enough for us. Soon after moving out, the Spencers find a new home I would have to say that was one of the happiest days of my life. The apartment we got was still in Seattle, but not as good as where Ballard is. But somehow, I felt like it was a refuge for me. At least I could have peace of mind there. Say cheese. Cheese. In May 2007, Bill Spencer graduates from college. No problem. See you at the graduation party? You bet. Should we go? Let's go. See ya. Bye, guys. Congratulations. Despite the trauma they've endured, the Spencers have come to terms with their experience with the supernatural. But it has also forever changed how they view the world. I used to not believe in anything supernatural. I always thought that if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, it doesn't exist. There are some things in this world that cannot be seen.
darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. When Jim and Joanne Whitley transform an old farm into a working horse stable, they believe they've achieved their dreams. But the Whitleys don't realize their hard work has stirred a dormant presence, dead set on evicting the living. As their family crumbles, Joanne resolves to take back her life and fight for what is hers. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. For centuries, the state of New Hampshire was a battleground. Here, Native American tribes fought over the fur trade, while French and English armies slaughtered each other for control of the new world. Today, the gray granite stones jutting above the land name only a fraction of the souls lying beneath. Joanne was raised, farm girl tough. I'm an honest, hard-working person. If there's a problem, she fixes it herself. I started working on farms when I was nine, and basically I knew as a, as a child that's what I wanted to do with my life. Her husband, Jim, is cut from the same self-reliant mold. It's a way of life they've instilled in their son, David. We're gonna need you on this one, buddy. The Whitleys moved to Kingston, New Hampshire, with dreams of opening a horse stable and breathing crisp country air every day. But an ominous force challenged those simple goals. And now, Joanne is fighting not just to preserve her dreams, but to preserve their lives. Sixty pulse, one hundred and ten. Ready for trauma as fast as you can. We're prepping now. Joanne fears David has permanently damaged his spine in a bike accident. I felt totally helpless. He was in trouble. I just couldn't do anything for him. I just want to go see him. Just give the nurse a second. For the Whitleys, this is the scariest moment of their 20-year marriage. I was like, oh, it's the end of my world. Had to be the worst day of my life. Here's what's going on. This line right here, he has a fractured vertebrae. He's gonna be okay. Probably. It's lucky it didn't cut into his spinal cord. Doctor? Excuse me. Joanne has no doubt that David's injury is the latest attack in her family's long battle with the supernatural. It's her son. I didn't know what could happen next. Somebody could die from this. But Jim isn't so sure. It could just an accident. I was really scared, but I didn't know if that was just a bad string of luck or there was something else going on. Nobody's life is like this. I've got to do something. Find a way. With my son breaking his back, I had had enough. I need to do something. And I need to do something fast. For years, Joanne has sought logical explanations for the negative presence besetting her horse farm. But the uncanny activity has defied all logic. Now, Desperate, she puts her faith in a psychic. There have been so many things happening for so long now. And now with this attack on my son, it's hard to explain. I just didn't know what to say or how to feel. Can you help me? I don't have any power over what you're facing. 
But who else can I go to? We've tried everything. This is my last attempt to get some help. I'm sorry. There may not be anything to do but move. Nothing is going to take my home from me. This woman works with energy. She may be able to help you. Thank you. That night, from her stable office. Hello, my name is Joanne Whitley. I understand you might be able to help me cleanse my property. Sue Bernier practices Shambhala, a discipline that balances residual energy transcending time. Everything is comprised of energy. Our thoughts have energy. Our words carry energy. Sue's heard many stories right. just like Joanne's. What sort of things? People call it poltergeist, demons, spirits. But they all have the same effect. Negative energy will start to take you over. The stronger the force, the bigger the incident. You've suffered a lot. And those are just some of the things that have been happening. I started seeing her property. I started feeling nauseated, that shortness of breath, which typically signals there is a negative energy. Do you think you can help? Well, I can try. What exactly does that involve? I heard the despair in Joanne's voice. And I knew I was in for more than your typical clearing. And the symbols of Shambhala to help them ascend. How soon could you come over? I can be there tomorrow. I Thank you so didn't want to get my hopes up, and I was a little skeptical. Oh, I didn't know she could help us. Nobody's been able to help us before. The next afternoon, as Sue approaches Joanne's home, she senses the property's former inhabitants. Using Shambhala, I can see a picture book of errors. I saw a Native American. I saw kids playing. It was as if I was going back through time. I hear the people, I feel the people, what moods they were in, how they died. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh. Hi, I'm Joanne. Thanks for coming Hi. out. Nice to meet you. Wow, you have a really interesting property. Well, we've done a lot of work. It was in terrible shape when we first saw it. Joanne tells Sue the story of her family's history on the farm. When they first found the property, it had sat abandoned for years. This is it, Jim. This is perfect. You know, I wouldn't say perfect. The 300 acres of open land are just what Joanne needs to fulfill her lifelong dream, opening yeah. her own horse farm. Horses and her, uh, they're, they're like one. Her love was that great for them. Jim is an electrician by trade. There's certainly enough land for your business. But he's skilled in all areas of home repair. Mom, I can help fix it up. David shares his parents' excitement. You got plenty of land. Especially being a young boy, you get to go out and explore. Come on, let's go check it out. It was a mess, but we knew we could turn it around and make it a beautiful home. Over the next year, Joanne invests all her resources into renovating the property and preparing her business. 
Once we made the house livable, we concentrated on... More visions of spirits filled with despair flood Sue's head. Shambhala is her state of mind. You cannot simply switch it off. You are sensitive to what is taking place around you. Are you all right? Uh, I'm fine. Uh, you were saying? I had teaching horses, and we also boarded private riding horses. Finally, Joanne is ready to recruit boarders and students. I expected to be happy and have healthy horses and have happy students and just live my dream. This is very nice. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> uh, some little wiring problem, we'll get it fixed. The lights just wouldn't stop going on and off, but it was a very creepy, strange feeling and these students started becoming very uncomfortable. Later that night. Did you sign up the new student? Well, I was taking him back to my office to sign and the lights started flickering on and off. I was in disbelief. Well, I wired that myself. You know, I'm a licensed electrician. And when I do something, I make sure everything's tight and meets the code. It's no biggie, they'll sign anyway. But even when the lights are on, it's pretty dim in there. Uh, you'll want to add some more lights. I'll check the wiring before I go to work tomorrow. The new lights are going to have to wait. Fine. The next morning, the inspection leaves Jim baffled. And I checked through it, looked at the wiring, the circuit breakers. I couldn't find any problem at all. sounded like there were some children out there playing. I, I didn't see anybody. It was a little frightening. When you hear things like that, it just makes you wonder. I don't know where it came from, but I just brushed it off and kept doing what I was doing. Fix it? <laughs> there's nothing to fix. There's got to be something wrong. No, there's nothing. Huh. Must have been a fluke. Now I've got to get to work. Joanne's business flourishes within months. We were full really fast. Some of the horses were my own, but the majority were student horses. My whole dream was to have students that would want to compete. I was a very competitive instructor, and I wanted to be able to go to the shows with the students that were boarding here. Experience. Some of Joanne's students help out around the stable before and after lessons. Yeah, um, Frisco won't eat or drink anything. Have you taken him out yet this morning? Yeah, that's what's odd. Frisco is Joanne's favorite honest, horse, just needs to see Mama. but she's not worried it's because she knows his yeah, quirks. Each horse has their own personality. The things that they do sometimes just kind of boggles your mind. like the earth was rumbling, like horses were galloping. Uh, what horses got out? They're all here. 
I heard galloping. We haven't heard anything. We... I felt very uncomfortable. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't explain it. Hey, everything all right? Uh, did you just hear anything? No, why? What'd you hear? I'm not sure. It sounded like a herd of horses just stampeded past the office. Odd. Yeah. Has he been out there a while? As long as I've been out here. You all right? Yeah, I just thought I heard something. I'm sure it's nothing. I just know I heard and saw what I did. We heard this like old time type of music. Very clear. It was very, very creepy. There's like 300 acres back there. There's no houses, no people, nothing. Mom, I'm not making it up. I know you're not, honey. Come on, help me walk Frisco. As the weeks pass, Frisco's eating doesn't return to normal. The horses to me are just like having children. They need just as much care and just as much love. When several other horses begin acting sick, Joanne calls a vet for help. It's weird. Only my horses are sick. None of the student horses are. What's he been doing? Not eating. Seems to be uncomfortable. Um, it seems to have a bellyache. It appears to be colic. It could be from changing his schedule, his water, his feed. That doesn't make any sense. They're all on the same schedule. I feed them all hay and oats, and it's top quality feed. I couldn't understand why they were getting sick. If that's the case, I may have to run some additional tests. That was really upsetting me, as well as my students. Tests? Look, I have my horse here, and I'm worried. Could she catch this? If it's colic, and I think that it is, you have nothing to worry about. But I don't feel comfortable with it's this situation. It's not contagious. <sighs> Sorry about that. She means well, but she can be a little nervous. That's understandable. Yeah. I'm gonna give your horses some mineral oil until I get these tests back. Just keep them on their feet, keep fresh water in front of them. I've That's worked on farms with 60 head of horses and never had this many illnesses. Something was happening. It was a very negative feeling. Strange things like that continued to happen. And I had this growing feeling that our lives were being invaded. Sue is not surprised that Joanne's favorite horse had been feeling uneasy. Like a... Most animals are more susceptible to spirits. The spirits or energy just keeps crossing them. They don't know what's going on. First of all, it got worse. All my horses got worse. To hear the horses from the house, Joanne and Jim install an intercom. There. That's done. Perfect. You know, you hurt David's feelings the other day. What was I supposed to say? <laughs> it was obviously the wind. Maybe it was, but next time, cut him a break. OK, I'm sorry. Sorry. Hey, by the way, I ordered the lights you wanted for in here. Thanks. As the weeks pass, Joanne develops close friendships with her students. I want you guys to think about writing in some competitions. Maybe. Hanging out with them helps take her mind off the negative feelings she senses on the property. Ladies, please excuse me. I'm going to get going. Oh. See you later. Bye. Kiss, kiss the baby. 
guys, I really think I could win a competition. <clears throat> it's a little hard your first time, Deidre. That's not my Sierra, is it? No, that's definitely Frisco. We're still waiting for the test to come back. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Mm. It was a man's whistling. Your husband's a hell of a whistler. That's not Jim. He's out of town on a job. Well, then who is it? I don't know. Let's find out. And the students were scared to death. I didn't know if when I'd open the doors, if there'd be something or someone standing there. I had no idea what to expect. I felt like there was a presence watching me. That made me feel extremely uncomfortable. This is freaking weird. I don't know. What is going on here? I don't know, Deidre. Whatever, this whole place is freaking weird. Come on, let's just call it a night. How could I fight the sinister feeling or thing, if it wouldn't show itself to me, how could I get rid of it? Hey, Jesse, how's it going? Uh, yes, I know what Deidre said, but that's just Deidre. No, a Allison's just not sure if she's going to stay. I understand. What am I gonna do next? If everybody leaves, I'm no longer gonna be in business. definitely something hugging my leg. Hey, honey, I got the lights. Not now, Jim. <laughs> Not now? <laughs> Come on, you've been riding me about this forever. Something's here. Something just grabbed my leg. <sighs> To really make me say, yes, I'm a true believer, it would probably have to come up and bite me right in the backside. Joanne, I... I know there's something. I don't know exactly what it is. With or without Jim's support, Joanne cannot sit idly by as her horses continue to fail. 
One night, while Jim works overtime, she meets with an acupuncturist. Joanne hopes the alternative therapy will soothe her horses while she waits on the vet's lab tests. Thank you so much for coming out. I just hope I can help. Joanne doesn't realize the acupuncturist has psychic abilities. What's wrong? This isn't just about the horses, is it? She turned to me and said, do you mind if I say something to you? There are spirits. She said, do you realize you have many, many spirits here? Finally, somebody is seeing and feeling what I have been feeling. Why are they here? Sometimes earthbound spirits are trapped. Maybe they died a horrific death. Maybe some force is holding them here. The healer suspects the answer lies buried in the land's past. There are some rituals that may make peace, at least for a little while. It was like a big cloud of negativity over my farm, and I needed to find out why and try to put a stop to it. Can I have a look? Later that night, Jim is still away on his job. Everything's fine. I've just been reading up on the history of Kingston. You know, a plague came through in the 1800s. Wiped out half the town. Oh, scary. Look, I'm probably going to be stuck here most of the night. Yeah, do what you got to do. We'll be here. Yeah, I knew you'd understand. How's David? He's fine. See you in the morning. Bye. Every night, Joanne goes to the stable for one last check on her horses. I hear and feel someone walk by right next to me. Now it's going after my son. He's my whole heart. He's my whole reason for being. I had to put an end to it. Joanne has felt isolated from her husband since first sensing a negative presence. Joanne? He was a skeptic, but I didn't know who else to turn to or who else to tell. You know I've heard things. David heard footsteps last night. Footsteps? <laughs> come on, it's an old house with creaky floorboards. I mean, if there's something here, how come nothing's happening to me? Maybe you're just ignoring well, maybe you're just imagining it. She was very angry. If I don't believe something, I don't believe. And what do you want to do, move? Give up your business? 
I'm not giving up anything. This Saturday, I'm going to try to cleanse the property. Cleanse the property? The lady who came to help me with the horses, she told me what to do. Well, there's a source. Just take David away that afternoon. No, I was going to go and... I don't care what you were going to do. Take him to town. Hello? Frisco Tesserin? What does that mean? I, I, I don't know if I can do that. Thanks. Thank you. Nothing can be done to ease the horse's suffering. For Joanne, losing Frisco is like losing one of her family. And I loved her beyond belief. But she will not be scared away by the negative presence. This was my property. It was either them or me, and I wasn't about to give up. That Saturday, Joanne burns sage to cleanse the property. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. This whirlwind of voices and, and air and everything light, started love, happening. And banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. Cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. I cleanse this building with light and love and banish all negative energy. Everything stopped. And it was beautiful. I just kind of sat back and said, wow, I did it. I beat it. For a good while, things returned to normal. Jim and I were getting along better. I really wanted to build my business up, and we'd been saving. So we decided to invest our savings in an indoor riding arena. What happened? We hired a contractor and he cleared that field. Sue realizes that Joanne has unwittingly provoked the spirits all along. Having a home and property that is in constant change will cause the spirits to uprise and start to attack. One night, not long after breaking ground for the arena. Mm -hmm. Hello? What about all our money? Thank you. He's bankrupt, Jim. Our contractor is bankrupt. But apparently, he owes everybody money, and he skipped town. Nobody's heard from the guy in two weeks. We had put our life savings, as well as our son's college fund, into this project, and to lose that money was absolutely devastating. I know a lawyer. Maybe there's a way to get some money. He's here. gone, Jim. We've got to try. You of all people know that.
I felt like I was in a boat going down to the bottom of the ocean. Mom, what is it? What is it? I heard the man's voice. Joanne thought she had banished the negative presence. No, I don't want to live here anymore. But it was lying okay. in wait. I'll make it alright. I'll make it alright. Joanne's property is besieged by a negative presence. Good riding today. But she resolves not to be intimidated and even recruits new students. There's a regional event coming up in three weeks. That sounds great. What about the indoor riding arena? I know we've had some delays, but we've got everything under control. Oh my God, look. I had never seen anything levitate like that before. Oh, I'm out of here. Me too. Now it's starting to throw things and, you know, what what could happen next? Could it be a knife? Are you okay? Thanks, I'll be fine. Okay. I became so overcome with anger at that point. I was ready to fight it and fight it any way that I possibly could. Later that night, when Jim comes home... I'm calling a priest to bless this home. Joanne pleads with her husband for support. Say that you believe me. If I accept that there is something supernatural happening on the property, then I will have to do something about it. I want to. And I don't know what to do. You know I'm here for you. I, I, I believe in you. It's just... Daddy. Daddy. David's in bed, right? We both heard mommy and daddy, but there was no denying it. A few days later, the Whitley's parish priest blesses their home. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Peace be with this house and with all who live here. May the God whom we glorify with one heart and voice enable us through the Spirit to live in harmony as followers of Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. For a while, the blessing helps. But Joanne still senses the lingering presence. Don't you have lessons this afternoon? Not anymore. Gotten into you. Ah! Call the ambulance. It's gonna be all right. You're gonna be all right. All I could think of is, oh my God, he could be paralyzed. Everything's gonna be all right. I felt totally helpless. We can't deal with this anymore, and I'm scared for my son's life. So, Sue isn't surprised that neither the priest nor Joanne so could cleanse the, right the property. The reason why blessings and smudgings don't work on a property is they don't hold enough strength, enough vibrational strength to actually remove what is there. It can subdue, but it usually comes back. Do you think you can get rid of them? Well, I don't exactly get rid of them. In Shambhala, we try to heal the negative energies and help all the spirits to ascend. Is that dangerous? It can be.
I'd like you to meet my husband, Jim, and son, David. When I first met Sue, I said, I've uh, met you before. Not that I know of, I haven't, but I felt very comfortable with her. It, it was very strange for that connection to come right away. I'm going to take David into town. Sue thinks it's best if no one is home during the cleansing. She said that it's like opening a door to the other side. These spirits, they could attach themselves to people around her. I was concerned. There was evil on the property. And it was the largest spiritual gateway that I've come across. Aren't you going with him? I feel like I need to stay. Well, I need to walk the property. Sue believes the presence has retreated to the woods surrounding the farm. I'll be in the stable. Good luck. Okay. Joanne is used to doing everything herself. But now, she can only wait. We were all hoping that this would work. We were just hoping and praying that she could help us. I could feel my hair starting to rise in the back of my neck. What was coming at me was evil. When I walk a piece of property, things come to me in different ways. Mostly I sense. I can sense who's standing beside me. I can sense who is walking towards me. I see the dimensions that are trapped there. When working with energy, you can be harmed. I have been stabbed. I've been scratched, choked, pinned down. cleanse the property, she must convince the spirits to move on. You are no longer alive. You do not belong here. And the anticipation was incredible, waiting to see what the outcome was going to be. I want to help you ascend to a better place. Sue senses the spirits want to ascend. But something is holding them back. You are free to move on. Every spirit has to be released. It must. My stomach starts turning. My heartbeat starts racing. I knew what was coming at me it was evil.
Samuel. Samuel. Sue realizes it is Samuel who has held the other spirits captive for centuries. The only thing going through my mind was, am I strong enough for this job? It wasn't a question of who was gonna win. It was I had to come out alive. Pulling my neck. He's ready to rip it off. You're not alive! Do not belong here! When I pushed him down, I released all of his negative energy and I could breathe again. All free now. You can go. It almost made me want to cry. Just the release of their energy and the relief that they felt. The ability to ascend and the freedom. Amazing. Amazing. I could hear the birds chirping. The sun was out. It was like a big blanket had been lifted off of me and off of my property. She is forever grateful to Sue. Sue is the one true help that we've had here throughout the years. The presence is finally gone but it has changed Jim and Joanne forever. I'm not sure where I've got the inner strength from. It's probably from God, but I know that I have the strength to fight anything when it comes to the health and well-being of my family. It's made me believe that there is something else out there. What? <laughs> it's hard to really explain but there is something else.